Okay. Um, let's read from where we left off. Um, so we're looking at you know some some of the arguments or reasonings that people might have um, generally about when it comes to the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, you know, then supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit, um, especially you know the fact that God wants us to walk in the supernatural. You know there could be some reasonings against that, right? So we are we are looking at some of these. Um, um, scriptural reasonings that people might have. Okay, so let's look at 1 Corinthians 13 verses 9 onwards, right? So where Paul writes, uh, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Okay. So while talking about the gifts of the Spirit, which is in 1 Corinthians 12, and continuing in 1 Corinthians 14, in between this chapter 13, Paul when he's talking about the love of God, and uh, you know, there he writes this. Okay, for I know in part, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Okay, so, so he's talking about prophecy. Okay, this gift of prophecy. When we, uh, what is prophecy? You know, when God speaking to man through man. Simple definition of prophecy, right? Uh, bringing edification, exhortation, and comfort, which we see in one Corinthians fourteen. It's prophecy, speaking as inspired by the Holy Spirit, or doing, you know, as inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's prophecy, right? So, so he's saying, we know in part and we prophesy in part. Meaning, when we, when there's prophesying involved, it doesn't mean that you'll know everything about the person, right? It's because it's it's a word or it's a part of information that God reveals. And it is to bring edification, exhortation, comfort, you know, and maybe correction, uh, guidance about the future, everything, right? So he brings. So we know in part, and we prophesy in part. So Paul is referring to that. We don't know everything. We don't know phone number, address, you know, date of birth, everything about the person to whom we are prophesying, because it's only what is revealed by the Holy Spirit, and it could be just a part of it, a part of the information, right? Okay. So he says. That when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part, which is prophecy and maybe you know all the gifts of the spirit, that will be done away with. That there will be no more reason for those gifts to be there. So, what is he talking about when he says that which is perfect has come? Okay. So in 1 Corinthians 13 and 10. Okay, so let's, let's look at, um, yeah, we, look, we looked at that, right? Uh, when that which is perfect has come, that which in part will be done away with. So, so the thing is that people think, okay, what is perfect? Okay, what is perfect? God is perfect. Jesus is perfect. The Bible is perfect, right? So we have the perfect word. We have the Bible in its entirety, in its fullness. So there is no more requirement for the gifts of the Spirit. Like there is one understanding, there is one school of thought. Okay? That is perfect has come. That is what Paul is referring to. You know, people say that the Bible has come, Bible is there. Therefore, there is no need for this prophecy and all these things, gifts of the Spirit. Okay? But you know, it is true that the word of God is perfect. It is true that it's infallible, inerrant, right? There's no error, right? We know that it's the word of God. However, he explains what is this perfect. Okay, let's look at that, um, you know, uh, verse 12. Okay, he's talking about the same thing. In verse 12, he says, For now we see in a mirror, dimly, face to face, uh, sorry, dimly, so it's like seeing in a mirror which is dim. But then one day 
I will see him face to face. Right? So now, you know, I, I see a bit of it. I see, you know, this. It's like seeing in a mirror, which is dim. But then he says, face to face. And now I know in part. There are certain things that I know. There are a lot of things I do not know. I know a part of it. But then I shall know as I am known. Is that, is that what he says? Yeah, verse 12. So he's referring to a point in time when we will, there will be, you know, no need for these gifts because we will see Jesus, we will be with him, we will see him face to face. Right? So there is no requirement for prophecy or prophesying because you're in the presence of Jesus. Right? There is no need for that. There is no need for these gifts of tongues and so on because you are in the presence of Jesus himself. You see him face to face. He's saying, you know, I will know even as I am known. Now I know in part, but I shall know just as I also am known, which means that, you know, you will know because you are in the presence of Jesus. There's no need for these gifts anymore. So that is why he says, you know, that when that which is part, uh, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. So what is he referring to is to it as perfect? He's definitely not talking about the word of God there, even though word of God is perfect, word of God is without error, right? It is, it is inspired, etc. All those attributes are true. But here he's talking about a time when we will see him face to face, right? And he's also saying, right, now abide faith, hope, love. These three, the greatest of these is love. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13. Let's look at um, some more verses there. He says, um, when he's talking about love, he's saying, verse 8, love never fails. Love never fails. He says, and after that, he says, whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Or, in other words, he's saying it will come to an end. These prophesying and all that will come to an end. He's saying, you know, um, whether there are tongues, they will cease. Right? This praying in tongues and everything will come to an end. When we see Jesus face to face, right? There will be no need for us to be edified, built up more in the inner man because you are face to face with Jesus. You have now got the complete redemption, right? You, you are in a glorified body, right? And uh, there is no more requirement for you to be even more edified. So saying prophecies, it will end, right? Whether there are tongues, it will cease. And he says, whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Right? Because you are in the presence of the one who is all-knowing. So he's saying he's, he's looking at a future time when we see him face to face. He's saying all these things will come to an end, but love, that will remain. Right? That's the very nature of God. That's the very heart of God. So that will continue to be there. That will not end. So when he says you know, love never fails, he's talking about that. Love never comes to an end. Here... And even in eternity, it will continue to be there. These gifts, there is a time, date, you know, on it. Beyond a point, it will, you know, it it is it will cease, it will stop. So that's what it means, right? So that so, you know, some people have taken it to mean that yes, prophecy will cease, tongues will cease. Why? Because the Bible has come. We have received the perfect word. But if you look at, if you read through, that is not what Paul is saying. That is definitely what Paul is saying. Because after chapter 13 comes what? What comes after chapter 13? What comes after 13? 13 ke baad kya hai? Gifts of prophecy and prophecy. After 13 comes 14. Right? So Paul is not finished. He's not done yet. He's continuing with chapter 14. And he is explaining again. He's continuing with the gifts. He's saying, hey, this is how you, you, you 
work with tongues. This is how you prophesy. This is how you do it in a collective setting. And finally, he ends chapter 14 by saying, desire earnestly to prophesy. Okay. He's saying in verse 8, chapter 13, he says, whether there are prophecies, they will stop. But what is he saying at the end of 14? Desire earnestly to prophesy. 14, verse 1, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts. So he's continuing. He's saying, you know, this is the life, normal life of a believer, that they will manifest the power of God through these gifts. Okay? Right. Um, see some questions here. No questions. Sorry, uh, did someone say something? Gertrude, did you say something here? Um, I thought someone no, said... Pastor. No, No, okay. Okay, fine. So, so this is the thing, right? So this passage normally is you say that all the work of the Spirit has come to an end. Okay, it is what we call as a cessationist um, theology, you know, that everything has come to an end. Now we do not need the gifts of the spirit or the power of the uh, power not the power of the holy spirit mainly they talk about the gifts of the spirit right so we see that paul doesn't talk about that okay okay then an another argument about the supernatural or the gifts of the spirit could be hey what if there is a counterfeit right see what is if it's a counterfeit gift what is it, if it's inspired by satan what is it's something that is not of god Okay, and you get deceived and you get fooled. Okay, the first one, of course, is that when we ask the father, he does not give anything that is harmful to the children. Now, we are putting our faith not in Satan. We are putting our faith in Jesus. And he's the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. The, the father is the one who sends the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit to us. So we can trust in him absolutely. You know, if we trust our earthly parents, we can trust our Heavenly Father even more. Right? We can trust Him. Then the second thing is about the counterfeit, meaning, you know, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, Okay. So 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, right? It says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Okay. It's coming, it's talking about the about the demonic powers. It's talking about the the lawless one, the antichrist. It's saying that it, it is like this with demo, lying signs and wonders. Okay, which means it's not from the true source, it's not from God. Okay. Second Corinthians 11, Paul himself says. For such are false apostles. Okay, uh, Second Corinthians eleven verse thirteen. Such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. For no wonder, for Satan himself uh, transforms himself into an angel of light. Right. So, if the so it's no wonder that the ministers themselves transform themselves into a uh, into like just like how Satan into ministers of Light while you know they are they transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whereas they are empowered by the enemy. Okay, so now, um, so this, this is the thing, right? So it is true, these two scriptures are true, right? But Paul is warning the church that there will come a time that there will be a counterfeit. There are people who do these things, and the source is not the Holy Spirit, source is something else okay it is the evil one. empowered by the evil spirit the lawless one will come okay now the practical understanding we should think you know in 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 today's world we have our actual real money we also have counterfeit money yes or no right sometimes we give money and then we give it in the petrol bank pay and then they say no this is not real or you give it in the bank and they say this is actually duplicate. It's counterfeit. Okay. So because there is counterfeit, do you stop using the real thing? Question. Right? Let's say 500 rupees 
notes counterfeit is there right do you stop using 500 rupees notes do you stop using 100 rupee note because there are counterfeit you will still use it you will still use the real one you will not you will be careful right when you receive thinking okay is it real or you will check with the bank you might do that but you will not stop using the real thing just because there is a counterfeit right so that's the thing even in the bible we see that there were counterfeit acts of power okay for example if you look at moses and the magicians moses goes to meet the pharaoh egypt right um we read it in exodus 7 okay so we uh, what was the miracle the lord says to moses exodus 7 8 you know you take your rod you put it down before pharaoh what will the rod become it will become a snake okay so moses is like wow wonderful power of god will be manifest i'm going the, the, i got the rod i'm going to take it I'm, i'll do it fine so he goes there okay verse 10 we read that so moses goes went into pharaoh and just like god did he does it okay he throws the rod rod in fact he he asked aaron to cast down the rod they do that it became a snake now what did the pharaoh do he called the wise men he called the magicians of his court and they came they came with their rods and their magic spells and it says enchantment enchantments each person threw down what did it become they also became snake right so whatever so there was a real thing according to the power of god they threw the rod became a snake these people came they threw that also became a snake right so what happened this snake swallowed up the snakes of the pharaohs oh, no whatever they threw down the snake actually swallowed up everything okay so two lessons we read you no know, we we learn one is yes there is a counterfeit right they can satan can do it satan can replicate it but there is a limit there is a limit that the power of god far exceeds the power of the evil one right because he is all powerful omnipotent god right satan is a created being right he might be powerful but he is god is all powerful therefore there is an end to the power of the enemy right so that's something that we learned that this snakes actually um uh, swallowed up okay and we see that happening then in chapter 8 also you know one after the other there were some plagues that came upon right and and the signs happened um these people were also able to do it okay so god like for example uh what was the demonstration the river turning into blood okay the river turned into blood or uh, the frogs came out of the river and covered right we see that the magicians also did the same thing chapter 8 okay but beyond the point they could not look at verse 18 exodus 8 was 18 says now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice which is that insect but they could not right they could not bring forth there was an end verse 19 then the magicians said to pharaoh this is the finger of god which means this is part of the hand of god finger is part of the hand of god this is the power of god right this is the finger of god but pharaoh's heart grew hard and then he did not heed right so this is this is something that we learn right so god did not tell moses moses stop you know moses whatever you're doing they're also doing so please stop it right i don't want people to get confused god didn't say that god just said you continue whatever i told you to do to press in to the work of the supernatural you do it so god did not stop so he continued and there was an end to the power of the demonic there was an end to the demonic power satanic power whereas god's power was more so that when they continued in the supernatural obeying god 
the magicians themselves said, hey, we cannot match. We cannot do this. This is the power of God. So there's a lesson for us, right? There's a lesson, and we see, um, you know, all these other uh, Old Testament about Elijah, the prophets of Baal, and so on, and also the ministry of the Lord Jesus. In fact, they accused Jesus, right? One of the things that they said, he does these things because Jesus delivered the person uh, from an evil spirit. And then what did they say? He does it by the power of Beelzebub, right? Just the prince of all the demonic powers. Jesus doing by that power. They accused him, right? So did Jesus stop walking in signs and wonders from that day? You don't see him doing that. He did not, right? He continued doing the works of the Father. He continued manifesting what he came to do. He continued the good works, the Bible says in Acts chapter 10. He did the good works and healed and brought about, you know, uh, the they healed everyone and brought about uh, the, uh, destroy the works of the enemy. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, Gertrude, Gertrude, we'll just come to that. Um, what your statement is. So, so that's the thing. So we see several instances of counterfeit. So that should not stop us from pressing in to the supernatural or believing God to work the supernatural in and through us because it is for the believer. Okay, okay. So, um, any questions here, Gertrude? You said you have a testimony of false prophecy. Okay. Uh, yes, Pastor. When I was in USA, my daughter was not well. Yeah. And uh, uh, they were on WhatsApp, there were prayer requests, you know, if anybody wants to be prayed. So yeah. I had uh, sent a message to one pastor uh, and um, he called me. He sent me a message that uh, I have to pay $250 because he got a uh, word from God that, you know, he has to go to the mountain to sacrifice and offer spiritual oil and spiritual belt and uh, mm. and something his, he told me. And uh, then I said, uh, I knew it was what he's telling me is wrong. So I wrote to him and I said, when Jesus has freely mm. given us, why are you charging? I said, okay. Jesus said, you, I have given you freely, freely receive and freely give. Yeah. So then he said, no, you, this is the word I got from the Lord. And you know that uh, mm. I have to do this because there is a generational curses. And uh, he was explaining so many things. So I knew in my heart it is not the right thing. And I, yeah. uh, I blocked him. Right, I right. blocked him, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, so there are, you know, there's a works of the flesh. There are, you know, uh, again, things like this where people you know, manipulate. And even during the time of Paul, it was like that where people, you know, it, Paul talks about these people peddle the word of God or, you know, they adulterate the word of God. They talks about, you know, how they use it for their benefit, right? The ministry itself, it's yeah. a way of them personally benefiting. So he talks, talks about those kind of things. Yeah. Okay. So it could be more of a work of the flesh and a yeah. manipulation you know, um, yeah, wrong prophecy and so on. Okay, so um, so we see in the ministry of Jesus, we see several other examples. The question is, you know, what if I do not believe? Now that's a very, uh, you know, important, I mean, very real struggle. What if I don't believe, right? Because Mark chapter 16, verse 17, the Lord is very clear. These signs will follow those who believe. So see, all this is a work of faith. Faith in the Lord, right? These gifts are gifts of grace, which means we don't earn it, but we believe. Right? We believe in the Lord. We believe in the Word, right? And the move of the Holy Spirit is is according to faith. So, uh, so that's the thing. Um, verse ch John chapter fourteen, verse twelve. Also, the Lord says the same thing. So this is what I tell you: that he who believes in me, okay. So faith in the Lord, faith in his words, faith in his power is at the foundation, right? So that's that's a real thing, right? Uh, when we say, when some people say, okay, I don't believe these things and for whatever reason, um, well, we can leave it at that. You know, there's nothing more we can do, right? Well, it's in the word, 
it's in the life of Jesus and we see it. So if people say, I, I still don't believe, then there's nothing more we can do. But we, we need to understand that faith in the Lord, faith in his word, faith in his works is something that is at the, at the very foundation of um, the works of the Holy Spirit through a believer. Right? Okay. Okay, so this is an invitation for all of us. Um, so I just want us to, um, you know, um, move to another part, which is uh, something about the gifts, uh, laying a foundation for the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, so this, which is in chapter 4. You know, if you can, because we have already covered the person of the Holy Spirit. We have already covered a few of those things. Uh, so we are directly going into chapter 4. Okay. Um, okay, we looked at baptism of the Holy Spirit, so we are, excuse me as I scroll, okay, um, okay, okay, so gifts, praying in tongues, etc. Uh, we just covered this, well, uh, I would encourage you to go through it. Right, it's uh, something that we covered already, but uh, you can go through. And uh, this aspect of anointing, we're going to look at it a little later. So um, I'm skipping that as well. Okay. So concerning spiritual gifts. Okay. So Paul writing to the Corinthians. This is what he writes. And uh, so it's not he's not writing to a perfect church. Okay. First thing we need to understand. To which church is he writing to when he's establishing this teaching uh, about the gifts? And he's saying, you know, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And he's writing to the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church was not the perfect church. Right? It was a very zealous church. We see that they were very zealous for the gifts of the Spirit. And it was a very spiritually gifted church. They had the gifts of the Spirit in operation, which is why... He had to write and give them guidelines and give them instructions as to how it should be used in the right way, right? Which is to edify God's people, to be a blessing to God's people and to glorify God. So he lays that all down. So we need to understand that he is not writing to a perfect church. He's, he's writing to a church which, which was, uh, you know, uh, which was established by him and um, which was where he spent about 18 months and uh, he he is writing to such a church okay i just want to move on to this section okay so let's um yeah so uh, you know, first thing that we see is that uh, in Paul's ministry himself, uh, when we look at Paul's ministry, we see that there are, you know, in his ministry, there was this work of the Holy Spirit, right? In his, uh, in his preaching, in his, uh, in his ministering, there was the manifest power of God, right? The power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit were evident, okay? How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 2 verses 4 and 5, okay? Uh, the reason we are looking at Corinthians is because we see that a major portion of the teaching about the listing of the gifts of the Spirit, the teaching is here. So that's why we are looking at it. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4 says, My preaching, sorry, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Okay. So Paul is saying that, see, my preaching, teaching, it was not just communicating these words of knowledge, communicating these words of wisdom, right? so that you should be blessed intellectually, so that you should understand. Well, that is there. But he says, but my ministering was in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. Okay, Look at verse 5. He says, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men or wisdom of human beings but it should be in the power of god okay so he's saying hey, your faith should be in god your faith cannot be in the ability of man 
right? Can't be in the wisdom of man. It can't be in the ability of man. Anything that comes from man, your faith should be in the power of God. So he says, that is why my ministering to you was not in words of just human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Demonstration means, what is a demonstration? Anyone? To show, you know, like suppose you buy, a, let's say you buy a vacuum cleaner, okay? Va vacuum cleaner or any kitchen item, maybe you, you know, they sometimes the salespeople come, assemble it, and they give you a demo, they give you a demonstration. This is how it works. Like they say, okay, this fitting in the vacuum cleaner, this is how it, uh, you know, you can take up all the thing. In case there is water, there's another kind of fitting, and this has all these three speeds, you know, you use it, etc. So they show you that, they demonstrate, right? So Paul is saying, my preaching was in demonstration. I showed, right? Demonstration of what? Demonstration of God's power. Demonstration of the power of God uh, and uh, and demonstration of the spirit and of power, right? And the, the, the reason he did that was that they should have, the people should have put their faith in God, faith in his power, in his ability, not in man's ability, okay? One more verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12, he says, truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So, so Paul himself, he taught and he demonstrated. Right? He made sure that people um, trusted in God, trusted in the power of God and not in his ability, not in his wisdom. Paul, we know, was a learned man. Right? He knew the scriptures. He, he learned under the best, under Gamaliel and so on. He knew the best. I mean, he knew the... Uh, you know, he taught. Uh, uh, he was taught the best, right? So we, we knew. We know he was a learned man, but he's saying, you know, your faith should not be in my wisdom or my learning, right? It should be in the power of God. It should be in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So there's nothing wrong in the in ministering in the power of God. Okay. Secondly, the move of the Holy Spirit that uh, we see in in the in the church, right? And so there was an outpouring of the Spirit. There were all these gifts of the Spirit. And so he's, he's teaching about these works of the Spirit, right? So 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, if you go to 1 Corinthians 12, first of all, he's saying, regarding spiritual gifts, you should not be, none of you should be ignorant. Okay, does that apply to us also? Yes. Right? It is for us also. You know, it's for the Corinthian believers. We are a New Testament church. It applies for us. None of us should be ignorant. We should come to a place of understanding what are these gifts. Okay, let's move on. So he says in, um, you know, um, chap verse 2, okay, you were Gentiles carried away to these idols, dumb idols, non-speaking idols, however you were led. So these were, this church were people who were worshippers of idols, right? He's saying these idols could not speak and you were actually led to them to worship them, like, etc. You were led to them, right? Verse 3 says, therefore, I make to, known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, you know, these spiritual gifts, these are vocal gifts. People can speak by the Holy Spirit, right? What are these vocal gifts? You know, this gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. You know, they, people speak as they are moved by the Holy Spirit, right? So he's saying these idols were non-speaking, but you, no one speaking by the Spirit of God or, you know, uttering these, uh, you know, these utterances by the Spirit of God can call Jesus accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So... So we, we, we learn something that, you know, about these vocal gifts and about the gifts in general that, well, it is by the Holy Spirit. These are not naturally developed abilities. Like, for example, there is a gift called gifts of healings, right? So, well, medically, a doctor can bring about healing, yes or no? They can treat the person, 
and make find out what the symptoms are and bring about healing to the body you know if there is a cut if there's a you know something they can administer so he's not talking about that well that is good right that is helpful that is beneficial to someone who's suffering he's not talking about that he's talking about purely the work of the spirit and the power of the spirit to bring about healing through the gifts of the spirit which is called gifts of healings okay right so we're not talking about um, natural abilities we're not talking about natural gifts okay then um, then this then the other thing that we see here is that our god is real our god is a god who speaks okay now that might seem like a very simple statement but the fact is many of us could be spiritual atheists okay now let me explain you know in theory we know that god speaks okay in theory we know that god is a living god jesus is living jesus is alive he's not dead now he's saying these idols they were dumb idols they were not capable of speaking communicating but still you you know you guys worship right so okay so now Jesus is the God who speaks, he communicates, he's living God, right? But though we understand that, in practice, we might not live our life as if Jesus speaks to us, right? Sometimes we, we okay, because these gifts involve that. These gifts involve understanding that the Holy Spirit can speak to me. The Holy Spirit can give me information inspire i can speak as inspired by the holy spirit i can you know as the holy spirit gives me utterance i can speak out the words given by the holy spirit right prophecy i as the holy spirit gives me that information i can speak it out right spoken by god to me and i speak it out right um maybe if it is uh, what are the other gifts you know gift of word of knowledge word of wisdom you know as he gives me this information, divinely inspired information, I speak it out. So it, it comes with the understanding that God is a God who speaks. Right? Now, we need to be, you know, we need to be really believers, knowing that God is a God who speaks. It is possible for Him to speak to me. It is possible for me to hear from Him. Right? That should be, that should be the way of the believer. That should be the faith of the believer that my God speaks to me and I am capable, you know, if he's speaking, I am capable of hearing, listening, receiving. Right? So that should be, uh, that should be, that should be again a foundational thing for us, right, as believers. So, yeah, so he speaks, right? Then what do, what do we see? Verse 4, he says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Holy Spirit, which means there are different kinds of gifts coming from the same Holy Spirit. Verse 5, there are diversity of ministries. Okay, There are different ways by which these gifts are ministered, but it's the same Holy Spirit. For example, if it's a gift of prophecy, right, the pastor will minister the gift in a different way than maybe uh, someone who is serving in worship. But the same gift is from the same Holy Spirit. There, were, there are diversities of ministries, but it's again the same Holy Spirit, right? In ministering these same gifts, these different kinds of gifts, it could be different ways, but it's the same Holy Spirit. Okay, now what else? It says there are diversity of, diversities of activities, okay? Demonstration of the power of God, diversities of activities, but it is the same Holy Spirit, right? Which means activities meaning these, the power of God, uh, the workings of God, um, you know, the, uh, and the manifestations of God, right? There are different ways by which the power, God's power is manifested, but it's the same Holy Spirit. So we need to understand that different gifts, different ministries, diversity of activities, diversities of manifestations even, uh, but the same Holy Spirit works in all, okay? Um, it's very important for us to understand that. Like, for example, if we consider these gifts of the spirit to be like tools okay now 
you know, like a mechanic has a toolbox, right? Uh, what what all tools could he have in the toolbox? A mechanic. Huh? Screwdriver. He could have a spanner, right? Anybody know how to change a tire? Yeah. You what did you use? You use a spanner, right? Then you use a yeah, the, you use a jack to take it up, right? You use all those things. So the mechanic could could have a, a spanner, it could have a screwdriver, he could have other things, right? What about a plumber? One who fixes taps. He also will have a spanner. He might have a, you know, he might have other things also, right? Uh, other things like he might have an M seal, right? He might have a thing. What about an electrician? He also will have a screwdriver. He will have a hammer. He will have, you know, he has. So all these tool boxes, tool kit, the, the, the kit will have a tool, you know, the, he'll have a toolbox with all these different tools, right? But there are differences in the tools between, you know, all these people. But the, the toolbox is used to fix something, right? To solve a particular problem, okay? And, uh, and they use it in order to in order to solve if something effectively okay now there are different ways by which the plumber will use a screwdriver and the different ways by which an electrician will use a screwdriver or you know maybe a plumber will use a hammer in a different way the carpenter will use the hammer in a different way to drive nails right so there are different differences in which all these people will use the tools Okay. And there, there are different tools that they might use. Now, for example, you just think that all the gifts of the spirit to be like those different tools in a toolbox, right? And the plumber, the, the carpenter, the mechanic to be different kinds of ministries, right? So the gifts of the spirit or the tools will be used by the the different ministries in different ways. Yes. Yes or no? Yeah, you understand, right? But the toolbox has been given. God gives the tools. And he says, okay, these are the gifts. You use it. Right? But the different ministries or the different ministers, because there are diversities of gifts, diversities of activities, will use it in different ways. So that is what you know we understand. Yes, the gift of maybe, you know, prophecy or word of knowledge will work differently. It's, it's the same tool, but it works in different settings for different purposes. Okay. Okay. Um, verse 7, what does it say? The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Okay. Verse 7, do we see that? The manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which means the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, is given to each one for the profit of all. What does that mean? That means it is for the, what does it mean? For the profit of all. It's for the, it's for the good or bad? Good. It's for the benefit of all, right? So the manifestation of the spirit is for benefits, for somebody's good. It's never for somebody's, you know, destruction, right? So because we serve a good God, we serve a God who's holy, right? So the manifestation of the Spirit is never for the destruction of someone, never to bring down someone, never to destroy someone. It is for the profit of all. Okay? So that's something that we uh, understand here. Okay. Now, let's look at the list of the gifts. Okay? Verse 8 onwards. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another kinds of different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. Okay, so if you list them down, it starts with word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So we see about nine gifts which are listed here. Right? 
But because Paul talks about diversities of gifts, diversity of activities, we know that this is a representative list, meaning it's a, it's a sample. There could be more, right? Different ways by which the Spirit of God manifests. Okay? Okay. And so, um, verse, verse 11. Okay? Let's look at verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. Okay? It is, again, the Holy Spirit who works these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Okay? One and the same Spirit Works these uh, works these gifts manifest these gifts. So what does it mean? These gifts do not belong to the believer. Sometimes we say, no, no, I have this gift. That person has this gift. The other person has this gift. Right? You say that person has this person has this person has two gifts. This person has three gifts. You know that's a wrong usage because it all belongs to the Holy Spirit. He might give, he might distribute as he wills, which means according to his decision and choice. But ultimately, it all belongs to the, um, it, it, all these gifts belong to the, or originate from and belong to the Holy Spirit. Very clear. Okay, no doubt about it at all. Okay, then distributing to each one individually as he wills, which means he distributes as he wills. And he can, at a particular time, there can be multiple gifts, one or more, or multiple gifts can be given by the Holy Spirit. In, he distributes individually, right? This person, this person, this person. The Holy Spirit distributes, and he's the one who distributes as he will. So there is no end to this, you know, there's no upper limit, there's no lower limit to the number of gifts, okay? So the gifts don't belong to the believer. They are with the Holy Spirit. There's no you know, limit on the number of gifts. He distributes uh, yeah, as he wills, right? As he decides. Now, we have a responsibility. Okay. He decides, but we have a responsibility. What is that responsibility about these gifts? To manifest these gifts. We have a responsibility. What is it? First of all, I should believe, right? That's one thing. I should have faith. I should believe that, yes, these gifts are for me. And the Bible talks about pursuing or desiring, right? So which means I should have a desire. I should have an expectation that, yes, God will use me. And God will, the Holy Spirit will manifest these gifts through me. I should have a desire and expectation, okay? Okay, so we'll um, yeah we'll stop here, and then we'll continue in our in our next class, right?